Man, last night we kicked off our conversation about sanctification, about changing our narrative identity, uh, shaping, reshaping the way we think about ourselves, primarily in light of the fact that God's grace is not merely a thing of the past, that God's grace is for your now. That God's grace is inviting you into deeper intimacy, into a deeper knowledge of Him, into a deeper fellowship with others. We'll talk about that later in the week. Um, And uh, that God's grace is on the move. That we need to shape our narrative identity around the grace of the gospel. That we need to see the gospel as big, good news. It's not something small It's something that you can, as we just sang about, you can taste it. You drink it in. And by the way, I know the prayer for all the campus ministers, for me, for others who have helped put on this conference, is that wherever you are in your journey of faith, that you will taste and see the sweetness of Jesus in some capacity this week. And I pray that that would specifically be true as we talk about sanctification. Because what we saw and what we sang is just give me Jesus is the story of sanctifying grace. That we saw last night in Paul's uh, response about the hyperabounding grace. I mean, is it too good a news? Absolutely not. Why? Because this grace is not just a grace that calls you in, but it is a grace that transforms you. That Christ, we are united to him. We're united to him in his death, and so he has broken the bondage that enslaved you before. And that we are united not only in his death, but we are united in a living grace because he is the resurrected one. That we are God's workmanship. That's what Paul says in Ephesians 2, verse 10. And by the way, Ephesians 2, 1 to 10, great nugget of the gospel. If you ever struggle with one of your friends to talk about, hey, what do you believe? Man, Ephesians 2, 1 to 10 is a great category for you to understand Various dynamics of the human condition around justification, around God's grace, about, around regeneration, and around sanctification. And what he says is that we are God's workmanship. And I want you to think of yourself, your narrative identity, as those who are being worked on by God's grace. That God's spirit is alive in you if you are united to Jesus and he is working on you. When I think about workmanship, I think about my father. My father was a dentist by uh, profession. Um, but really his passion was in woodworking uh, and, and things that he could do with his hands. And uh, he loved to make furniture. He still does that at 76 years old almost now. And um, he's amazing because what he can do is he can take this block of wood and it looks like you might just set it aside and it might be for your you know, fire pit later. Um, and he starts crafting and working and shaving and cutting and digging in and sculpting onto that wood and it becomes a masterpiece. And that is you. God's grace is at work in you. You are not just a piece of wood to be discarded. You are not somebody else's trash. You are a treasure of the Most High God. And He is at work in your life. That is the grace of sanctification that He's inviting you into. To be His workmanship. And that we have a confidence. One of the things that God wants you to have is that He wants you to have an assurance of the fact that he is at work in you in order for you to trust him to take you where you're going tonight. Because we're going to go into some deep waters. And we're going to journey down a hard road. Because the road of sanctification is marked with suffering. There is a struggle in the journey of our sanctification. We're going to look at tonight from Romans 7 and Romans 8, a couple of portions, and then tomorrow night, actually, we're going to jump back into Romans 8 and cover the other portion that we're not reading. But Cyril's going to read for me, and then we're going to jump in. Oh, you're going to... Do you want my Bible? 
You got the app. You got the app. Yeah, it's funny. I, I actually forgot my Bible. I never use the app. I'm struggling. <laughs> it took me about 10 minutes to find these. All right. Romans 7, verses 15 through 25. This is the word of the Lord. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being. But I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God. Somebody say thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. Romans 8, starting at verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth, not worth, not even worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager, eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now, hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he also called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen, brother. I'm just going to have Cyril read the Bible to me. Um, amen. Amen. That's good. Um, hey, you know, sanctification, I hope you heard in Paul's words the struggle that's present within him. That this is not easy. That this is an arduous journey. It is a dangerous journey. That God is calling us to. It is a, a, a journey full of pitfalls and fear and trembling and faith and rejoicing and good. And I love my brother talking about uh, the spirituals and talking about the idea that we live in the tension and all God's people should. And by the way, we should learn from our black brothers and sisters in the black church about how to love and lament at the same time. To rejoice and to grieve. And you see this tension in Paul. And I want to be honest with you right now that, that this is kind of the anti-graduation speech, right? 
that some of you just got done with a graduation speech where you were told, you know what, the children are our future you know, treat them well and let them lead the way, um, you know, that, that, uh, that all the beauty and inside, you know, and you're just set off on this kind of high of like, yes, we're, we're the hope of the next generation and just, you know, exuberance and, and enthusiasm. And Paul is coming in and he's saying, hey, I invite you into this journey and guess what? You're going to get hurt in order to be healed. That you're going to experience pain on the path to peace. That we've got to embrace this journey that God is calling us to. And it is a journey into Jesus, the suffering one. That if we are going to be made whole, then we're going to go under the scalpel of the surgeon. And it's going to hurt. But it's good. So let's look at this together. And I want to look at a couple of things from this passage, these couple of passages that we read, to talk about um, suffering and the struggle of sanctification. Because it's really important, just like that narrative identity of understanding who we are, that if all of a sudden you're on this journey and you think, oh man, I accepted Jesus, this thing is going to be awesome, I'm going to get rid of all my sin, I'm not going to be tempted by those things anymore, I have accepted the Lord. If you think that That your kind of narrative identity of the grace of God is all of a sudden just magic. That you have no struggles anymore. It is going to be a rude awakening. I know not many of you grew up using maps. I'm not talking like Google Maps or the three or four of you that use Apple Maps. uh, (laughs) You know, or Waze, right? That... uh, But when I grew up, I grew up coming to Florida. And from Arkansas to Florida is a long distance. It's not Nebraska. It's not somewhere else, right? There's more distance in here probably. Um, But when you start traveling through the back roads of either Mississippi, which is a scary place to do that, and... um, (laughs) Or in Alabama, right? I'm like, I'm, there are too many, uh, there's yeah, all sorts of signs, <laughs> scary. But nowadays, of course, other than Michael Scott, who runs into a lake, you know, most of us just look at the app and we kind of follow kind of blindly. But I know that you and I, if you traveled down the way I came, and I still have my Google uh, you know, maps open, ways, whatever, and I'm going, okay, this is the way I'm supposed to go, and I'm passing by you know, numerous Confederate flags, and I'm thinking, maybe I'm not supposed to be here, right? And, and I start getting scared about that I'm not supposed to be on this path to get to summer conference. And... Um, And then by God's grace and by the grace of Google Maps, I arrive where I'm supposed to be. But it is through a dangerous place. And that is sanctification. Right? You think sanctification, you think lower Mississippi and lower Alabama. Right? (laughs) That, That you're going through the places that are scary and you feel like you're lost. And so if you don't understand where you're headed... You will feel like, man, I don't know if I'm ever going to get there. And I know some of you are right there right now. You trusted Jesus a long time ago, and you feel like, man, he has led me astray. That we love the first part of Psalm 23 that says that he will lead me to green pastures. That he, will, that he will restore me, he will lead me into refreshment, but we forget the fact that he says that it's through the valley of the sin and death, the shadows of death, that he leads us to the oasis. That is the journey of sanctification. And I want to look at a few things here tonight in light of that. One is this, I want to first look at why Why is there a struggle in our sanctification? Why is it so hard? Secondly, I want to look at how we are to struggle from these passages. And then I want to look at the confidence in our and the affirmation in our struggle. And then what I want you to see here 
is I want you to have, again, that narrative identity be informed because as you suffer, you don't think, man, am I on the right path? Has God abandoned me? Is he really there? Does he really care about me? And what God is saying is, I have not abandoned you, that actually I am promising you suffering. Why? The first thing that we see about why we are to suffer is this, from 8.18. Look at what he says here. For I consider the present sufferings of this, uh, excuse me, the sufferings of this present time not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed to us. Now truly there is a greater glory to come, but what I want you to hear first off of why we suffer is that this present time is filled with sufferings. This world, and I don't care if you're a Christian or not, wherever you are on the spectrum of faith, this world you know deep down is not as it should be. And what I want you to understand is the Bible affirms what your gut tells you. The Bible affirms that the world is not as it was created to be. That there is a deep fracture in the the course of God's shalom. That there is fracture and that Christ has come to renew and restore and to make all things new. But this present time is filled with sufferings. The Bible is an honest book. For those of you who are not Christians, those of you going along to the, to the uh, Juan Carlos' class on Scripture and those kind of things, one of the reasons, one of the ways we validate the, the authority of Scripture is because if you were writing and editing it, you would leave some of this stuff out. Because every one of the heroes of the faith were utter failures, murderers, adulterers. Fickle in their faith. They didn't look like action figures. They were fools. But God's strong arm, only Jesus, is the one that perseveres with them. And so we see the first thing of why we suffer and that we struggle in this present reality is because this present reality is broken. And brothers and sisters, I want to encourage you with something. I want to encourage you to cultivate a redemptive, godly discontentment. Because the world tries to tell you, you can find everything here. That you can find all the satisfactions of your joys. That if you just give in to this, or just imagine that, or if you just had a little bit more of this, or if this person just showed you attention over here, or if you had a little bit more power, and all of those are like sands out there on the shore. You will hold on to them, and they will drift through your fingers. And so we cultivate, as part of our sanctification, we cultivate a sense of godly discontentment. That this world is not enough for us. Do not settle for the longings and the hopes of this world. Do not project to your friends that this world has all that there is to offer. This present world that we live in is filled with sufferings. And by the way, this is also, in this reality of why we suffer, is also in really important ways in which we connect with our non-Christian friends and neighbors. Do you know that many of our non-Christian friends and neighbors tend to think like Christians are just concerned with like fictitious Christian religious stuff, right? We're just like, yeah, well, you know, what's the big world concern? Well, it's more Bible studies um, and, you know, we need to get Christian radio broadcast throughout the Middle East um, and whatever else there, you know, kind of kooky ideas these people have. And the reality is that we look at and we should be, if we're cultivating a godly discontentment, if we're redemptively using our imaginations to see the fractures of the world, then we are able to identify with our unbelieving friends and going, yes, it is fractured. Yes, that is injustice. Yes, that is racism. Yes, that is classism. Yes, I I, I think more highly of this group of people than this group of people. 
And Jesus came to heal. So there's a lot of suffering in this present time. And for that reason, we suffer. We're a part of this creation. We don't stand outside. But there's another part of this that as we are united to Jesus, why do we suffer? We suffer because we are united to the suffering one. That Paul says boldly and crazy that he says to us that he fills up what is lacking in the suffering of Jesus for the sake of the church. Not that there was something insufficient of Christ's cross, but what he's saying is as as we experience the grace that we talked about last night, as we are invited more deeply into the life of Jesus, then we actually fill out the sufferings of Jesus for the world. Not making atonement for the world, but embodying the sacrifice of the one that we trust in. That Isaiah 53 calls Jesus the suffering servant. If we are being formed by sanctifying grace into the image of Jesus, guess what? You're going to have scars like him. And by the way, scars do one of two things. We just, read, we just read from our, uh, from our call to worship from Hebrews. The scars of Jesus, what did they do for you and me? They made him more attuned to our pain. They made him more tender to where we are hurting. Do you know a God that is tuned in to your pain? That is a great high priest? That's not just religious language. That's saying you got someone who knows you. And scars, as we develop our own scars in following Jesus, they do of one or two things. They either create a sensitive spot for us that we don't want anyone to touch, that we want to keep people at a distance, that we don't want to be in, uh, other people to be invited into our pain, and we get hard. Or scars soften us, and they make us more sensitive to the wounds of others and we're more capable of being agents of healing and so the other reason that we suffer not just because this present time is filled with sufferings but because we worship a god who is a suffering god that most of our spiritual formation doesn't happen in the mountaintops all of us are chasing mountaintops we all want kind of these christian highs and by the way summer conference Pretty close. It's pretty awesome. Drink it in, right? But most of your spiritual formation doesn't happen in the mountaintops. It happens in the valleys. And if you don't understand that journey, if that's not on your map, you will be fearful and terrified that you're not headed in the right direction. And then there's another reason that we suffer. And that is because... As Paul talks about and as uh, Cyril introduced at the very beginning in Romans 7, 15 through 19, this kind of interplay and dialogue that Paul is going through and saying, I, I don't do what I want to do and I do what I don't want to do. And you see this wrestling and this rumbling. And you, under you understand that one of the reasons that we suffer and struggle is because sin is like a cancer. It's not like ripping off a Band-Aid, you know, where you, with your little kids, you know, around, you're like, okay, it's only going to hurt for a minute. It's not going to just hurt for a minute. As God, as our spiritual oncologist, cuts out what is deeply ingrained in us that has metastasized all over our body, then he is going to to wound or allow us to be wounded in order to heal. That he is going to open us up to pain because we got to get some of us out of this story. That he's got to cut us and our flesh, the worldliness that we have so deeply ingrained within us, we got to cut it out. So why do we suffer? We suffer because... This present world is full of sufferings because we're being molded into the one who suffered and because we got too much of us in here and it needs to be cut out. 
And then we see how then are we to see that suffering, the journey of suffering take place. Two things. One, it takes place gradually. You see the inefficiency in Paul's words here. He's not, it's not just a straight line to sanctification, right? It's not like, whoop, yep, next stop, holiness. I just showed up. Man, I can't believe it's like teleportation to holiness. There is no teleportation to holiness. It's only through the arduous journey. It's only through the backwoods of pain. And it's gradual. It happens over time. That it develops, that God cuts it out over time. I have a friend who uh, is a military vet and uh, in my church and he tells me all sorts of crazy stories. And one of the stories he told me was a guy who gotten uh, a, a, a grenade had gone off near him. And uh, it didn't totally blast uh, you know, a limb off or anything like that. But it, a grenade went off and he had about 30 pieces of shrapnel in his body. And uh, the doctor assessed him and said, you know what, you're not going to die from this. We're going to heal you, we're going we're gonna to put salve on you, and we're going to let this kind of develop. Because what's going to happen over time is your body is going to pull out those pieces of foreign objects gradually. And so what this guy did over a season of years would come back in every few months, and there would be this new sore that would develop, and the doctor would open him back up, and he would cut that little piece of shrapnel out. And then he looked at the doctor, and he's like, how long is this going to take? And the doctor says, as long as it takes. Because if God cut you open in one fell swoop, you would die on the surgeon's table. If he took the time to cut all the pieces of infection and cancer of sin and death in you at one time, we wouldn't make it. And so sanctification is gradual. And by the way, sanctification is also groaning. Did you see that? That the Spirit, the Holy Spirit empowers us to groan. And even when we don't have the capacity to groan, He groans on our behalf. We're going to talk more tomorrow night about the ministry of the Holy Spirit in particular. But this is one of those things about how sanctification takes place is that it is through groaning. It's labor intensive. It's gradual and it's with groaning. Spirit-empowered groaning, right? The fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, and oh! Because that's the power of God unto salvation for you. And the last thing is this, it's confidence. That in the midst of your suffering, it's not for, any, it's not for uh, nothing, it's... It's not vain in any way. That's that verse, you know, from Romans 8, 28, that some of you have heard, right? That we say, for all things work together. We know, I'll read from the beginning, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. Now, does that sound like comfort and assurance? Kind of. And for some of us, not at all. Because we've been through suffering and somebody threw that verse out there. When I was in college, I was a sophomore in college and my best friend from high school died in a car wreck. Single car, car wreck. And I remember sitting with, I mean this is a guy that I hung out with, I spent the night with probably four nights a week when I was a senior. He was my best friend. Um, and, uh, and he died and I remember being by his mom in uh, you know, at the funeral home and then back at her house again. And I remember her getting a card one day from a well-meaning, foolish Christian. All things work together for good. Aren't you encouraged? And what she received in that moment, and she dropped some kind of bomb when she heard it, um, it that what she heard in there is shut up. 
Because if you cry out and if you groan in the pain of the loss of your son and the suffering of this world, then you're not trusting God enough. And some people use that verse to do this. And please don't do that because actually Paul's intent is the exact opposite. It is to free you to groan and to free you to lament and free you to long for something better with the hope that your suffering is not in vain. Why do we know that? Two things, and then I'll close out. First, the cross of Jesus. Jesus' cross is the illustration that God works suffering for good. That as we pursue the cross of Jesus, there wasn't one ounce of Jesus' humiliation and his sacrifice and his suffering that the Father didn't use for your glory and your grace. Not a drop from the sweat of the capillaries that were bursting on his head did he let drop to the ground fruitlessly. But every cringe and agony of Jesus plays into your great salvation. And so, brothers and sisters, the promise of the cross and to you who have been united to the one who died is that God will use all of your suffering for his glory and his grace. There's no one-to-one. The economy of grace, don't ever let anybody go, yep, that happened for this reason. God's immense economy of providence is so much more amazing than that. But what we have in this passage is the promise of this. That the pain we feel are birth pains. Now, I've never had a baby. I sometimes look like I'm pregnant. But (laughs) I'm not. I have delivered a baby on accident. I'll tell you that story some other time, maybe. But um, I've been close enough to birth to know, you know what? It hurts. I figure, right? Okay, there's a lot of groaning. Um, And it hurts, but you know what? You know what's amazing about a mom who would be in labor, in the deep parts of labor and hurting and just crying out in pain and agony? The moment that baby arrives, the pain all makes sense. And what God is saying to you is that as he forms you by his grace and he takes you down this arduous journey and it's painful and it hurts and you are afraid that he's not with you anymore, that the pain you feel is not unto death but unto life because God's grace is on the move. The journey of sanctification is a struggle. But it is not unto vanity, it is not unto death, but unto life. God is molding you into the Savior who suffered for you. May we embrace that and see the glory of his grace in the midst of this present evil. As we look to Jesus and as he pulls us out of the story and puts Jesus back in. And heals us. May we submit to the one who is willing to allow us to hurt in order to be healed. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your great salvation. We thank you for your surgeon's scalpel. We thank you for the hope of the gospel. We thank you that you are not done with us. That you are at work in our lives. And we trust you, Lord. We praise you. I pray for these students as they struggle. As they suffer as they endure hardship, that they know that you are in their midst, forming them by your grace. You have not abandoned them. You are birthing life in them. In Jesus' name, amen.